Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.5. In this episode, I'm going to have to finish off that low resolution scan of the moon and hopefully we can do something about Mars. It turns out that the science day from space around Mars contract I originally had here was actually a science day from space around Saturn that was due to the change between 1.0.4 and 1.0.5. So we need to pick up some more Mars contracts to do here. Um, let me take a look at the tracking station and see our general situation. I forget if we've put a satellite in orbit around Mars or not. Now we've done 12% of the altimetry scan and I know people in the comments have suggested that I could just time warp and it'll probably get done. Obviously that's not 100% kosher because of the loss of electric charge on the probe. But maybe it's the least hassle and will allow us to get on to better things. I think I, I, it's fairly certain that I can get a, a thing into orbit around the moon. I, I hope that's not a, a question mark that I have to demonstrate. Um, anyway, let me just check Mars. Got a lot of stuff happening around the Earth. It doesn't look like we have anything in orbit around Mars, does it? I think we just did a flyby. That was probably a flyby mission right there, Mars Probe 1. And it looks like we have a contract to get into this orbit around Mars if you want it. Hmm. Well, I don't know how much that's going to give us. Let's see. Okay, so taking a look right now. First contract is position Nick Capable 1 in an adjusted orbit of Earth. And it looks like another one to adjust the orbit of the Swift 1. Uh, that would Those would both be very difficult. Uh, yeah. That, that would require like the claw or something to sort of tug it in the right position. That's not very lucrative. I don't even know why we're getting the sounding rockets anymore. Um, Deimos flyby. That's Mars. Failure is more than the advance and completion combined. That's pretty punitive. First docking. Launch a new vessel. Dock to another spacecraft. Limited time to build them, but actually it is pretty lucrative. It doesn't require any crew, I notice. That's interesting. You know what we could do is, for the Deimos flyby contract, we could have the mission launch in two pieces dock the two pieces of the mission together in orbit around the Earth. So one piece will be the booster stage to get to, Demo, uh, to Mars, and we'll actually dock it in orbit, assuming everything works. That's ambitious, and the failure for both of these is pretty high compared to the actual, uh, you know, value of completing them. Uncrewed Deimos landing, that might be a little bit overly ambitious considering our current state. So is the Tundra orbit around Mars. Wish we had a Mars orbit contract, but Deimos flyby is pretty much the same. If you gotta do a Deimos flyby, you're probably already in orbit around Mars. I guess we could try and position... If we got a flyby Deimos, it shouldn't be too hard to get a satellite in a specific position. Well... That's very touchy. The problem is that, yeah, it's just really touchy to get into orbit around Deimos. I remember that. But maybe, maybe that's a combination we can work with. So what I'm thinking of doing is, uh, in a sequence of two launches, do the docking, do the Deimos flyby, and position the satellite in a specific orbit around Deimos. So let me pick up these contracts. It seems like it's very ambitious. Pretty darn ambitious. But oh, uh, no, we can we can take that contract, yeah. Okay. But we're not trying to. Well, uncrewed landing. I I do want to figure out whether I can land on Deimos. Hmm. Well, if we're already in orbit around Deimos, I guess landing won't be too much of a problem. Ah, oh, heck, why not? Alright, so we've got our our massive mission 
all lined up for us. The instruments we need, we can do any experiment for that one. This one requires a barometer and orbital perturbation sensor. So here's my question now, if I time warp here, will I get more of this scan done? Okay, that, that's already a lot of time warp. So I can't get it done here. Oh wait, it did do, it did do some. We advanced by percentage. Okay, at that rate, if we're at a good inclination around the moon, it should cover that 75%. Okay, so we'll trust that that goes on. And let me focus on putting the docking and Deimos mission together. Okay, I think I have our first rocket ready, and this is the probe itself. As you can see, we have RTGs now, amazingly enough. And so I put three RTGs on the probe itself, very expensive choice but at least it'll be reliable hopefully I think um, if we take a look at the price of the probe it's 10,000 funds so very expensive each of the RTGs is 1,000 not as expensive as, a, expensive as I would have thought but still expensive um, we've got uh, asterisk engine on the transfer stage well it's not really a transfer stage we're going to send another transfer stage up and dock it with it so this will be the going around Mars stage and uh, the probe itself has only about 500 and that's really just to land on Deimos. Um, all the communications are on the probe, all the science is on the probe. None of the communications is on this asterisk stage. But we do have solar panels just in case the RTGs do not perform the way I think they should. Um, obviously we have an able avionics package there, plenty of electric charge. And then we have a little docking port assembly here, just just a docking port and a decoupler basically, and a tank to to smooth things out. And so I really want to, oops, I wanted to move this decoupler up a little bit so that it's a little bit closer to the asterisk engine, so we don't have that weird gap there. Payload wise, it's about five tons to low Earth orbit. The fuel in the in this portion should be quite enough to help with rendezvous and of course the main engine is blocked but fortunately apparently we now have the ability to config configure the RCS ports to Arizine and N204 which we did not have before we used to be limited to hydrazine so since the asterisk engine already uses Arizine and N204 I decided that that was the way to go and yeah so that's the situation there the second stage engine, this time, instead of bothering with the RL-10, since we're not doing any interplanetary transfer with this portion, uh, I've just got the RD-58, which is um, which is simpler, and doesn't have to use the service module tanks, which are really heavy. The benefits of the RL-10 are outweighed, literally, by the fact that we have to use the service module engines. I put two... Uh, NK-33s down here because uh, I could have used one and used SRBs I suppose but the NK-33s are cheaper than the SRBs <laughs> actually the NK-15s are cheaper than the SRBs so what the hey just put uh, put another NK-33 NK-15 and uh, add more fuel and it's cheaper so it's cheaper than virtually anything. I, I can't imagine using another launch engine ever again. I mean, it's just, they're so cheap that the NK-15 should just be always used. Um, so that's the situation there. Very cheap launcher. You notice the probe was like 11,000. The launcher is only 5,000. So very, very cheap launcher. And then the launch clamps. I, I don't know what the difference between these launch clamps and these launch clamps is. It looks like these take a lot more power. These have a technology perk with integrated Omni. Don't need too many of those. Same refueling rate. I don't know. Doesn't deliver... None can... Uh, well, okay. Well, that's the uh, same description, as, is it? Yeah. They just uh, changed a uh, number in the description on the first one. They failed to change number on the description in the second mention, the TT-18. But it's the same description, so nothing going on there. So I don't know what this is for. Maybe it's for smaller rockets. Maybe it'll help our stability situation. I put one of the one of the 
TT-18s high on the rocket, hoping that that will stabilize it better. But maybe I should unlock the faster launch clamps. In the past, the faster launch clamps have caused even more wiggles on the launch pad, but maybe that's all switched around now, so I don't know. Anyway, so obviously this mission is going to have a lot of extra Delta V if everything works out, or not as much Delta V as I think if things don't work out. But let's let's get on the launch pad and see what happens. Oh wait, let's build it, sorry. And I'm going to build a backup so that we can edit the backup just in case the first one doesn't work. Okay, while those are building, we probably also want to... Another benefit of not using the RL-10, well, the service module tanks don't have too much boil-off, I think. But we don't have any boil-off problem with this sort of rocket. So let me get the transfer stage rocket ready, and uh, we'll see how that looks. Probably I'll use the same launcher, since it's so cheap, and uh, it'll just be like a 5-ton transfer stage. Okay, I've opted for a completely different system, and so here I've got the RD-0109, which is a kerosene burning engine. And so there's a kerosene liquid oxygen stage, and we've got RCS thrusters, and we've got little packages of Arizine and N204 on the side for them. And this solves a few things. First of all, instead of using the asterisk, because we're not using the asterisk engine, uh, we don't need a pressure-fed tank, which means we don't need a service module tank, and the service module tanks are currently really, really heavy. I think I've explained that in previous episodes. So all we need is uh, little service module tanks for the RCS, fuel. I really, we probably don't need that. I think it's just the Asterisk engine that needs service module tank. And of course, you know, the RL-10 and stuff like that. But this is just a default tank. And you can see without its uh, payload, it, uh, it's got plenty of Delta V. With the five tons that it'll be pushing off to Mars, it's probably got about 3,600 to 3,800. So that's pretty good. The There are downsides. I think this only has one ignition. Let me check. So this one, yeah, this just just has one ignition. So we'll have to do all the maneuvering with the RCS thrusters. And I've got a bunch of them here to help out with that. Uh, that means that getting it into the right position with respect to the target is going to be a little bit tricky. Hmm. Yes, it will be. So, yeah. I would like actually an engine that has more ignitions now that I think about it. But I don't have such an engine with as high an ISP. On the other hand, our launcher can carry quite a bit more than just this, so maybe a less efficient engine would be a good idea at this stage. Now that I've built the rocket, the rocket seems to be able to carry much more. The downside is that the Agena core can only deal with 16 tons. And so we're using the Agena core for this, and that's only got a capacity of 16 tons, so if we put more mass on it, because we're using a less efficient engine, we're going to have to compensate by having another controller. So, yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea. Anyway, let's move on to the rest of the rocket. So that's theoretically our transfer stage. And then the next stage, which I have here, I have decided to go with the RD0210. Now, I was initially thinking about using this RD0110 because it's got the nice ISP and it's also got plenty of thrust. The problem with this is that I had node problems with it before on the bottom node not detaching from the procedural fairing. So I need to check that out. I haven't checked that out yet whether it's okay or not. So I decided to proceed with the RD0210 because if I have the node problem and we build the rocket, that's a lot of time wasted. So, yes, UDMH and N204 upper stage here. Yep, and again, we got to use the default tank, so we don't need to worry about, about the heavy mass of the service module. Got extra controllers here, and then I've sort of gone with a Soyuz style sort of thing, except we've got the NK-15s at the bottom. So it's all NK-15s. No need for vernier thrusters because, of course, uh, in this case, I've got gimbling NK-15s. We could have put non-gimbling NK-15s and put the vernier thrusters, but that's just more parts and uh, doesn't really do anything for me anyway. More cost as well. 
So the tricky part will be booster separation on that stage, otherwise plenty of delta V as you can see. And maybe I need to rethink the upper portion because we only have one ignition on the main engine. I think the best solution is this RD58 or whatever other variant I have of it right now. The RD58 is a little bit more advanced because it's got five ignitions, it's got more thrust and better ISP. It's more expensive, I think. Well, we can switch to this other one, the M. 11D33M. Okay, that does better. Okay, unfortunately its bottom node seems to be a little bit too high in this version. I don't know how that happened. I seem to recall it being okay before. But anyway, I, I fixed the fuel mixture and everything. And it's got the five ignitions. Let me check its pricing. 400 versus this one, 350. Well, that's hardly any difference. This one's a little bit lighter, but not that much. We do get more Delta V out of this version. And we haven't uh, had to add a new core. So this is a good deal. All right. Well, uh, testing a whole new rocket again. Yep. Trying to look at the numbers here. Uh, 5, 000, uh, that's uh, 6,300. It looks like we've got like 10,000 in the launcher itself. So we definitely have more capacity. Okay, saving. And let's build two. Okay, so I've uh, arranged the build queue so that we've got them alternate, alternating. Uh, Deimos 1, Deimos 2, Deimos 1, Deimos 2. It looks like all of them will be completed before the Earth to Mars transfer window. Now this is an alarm clock window. Let me try transfer window planner instead. Because the whole inclination thing, alarm clock seems to assume circular orbits. We don't really want that. We are going to be doing an insertion burn, so that's important. And so, yeah, let's try and plot this. I don't think we need to get to 100 kilometers, but it's not going to make too much of a difference. 5,886 seems like we have that, including the Astra stage on the probe itself. Yeah, that's, that's pretty doable. Let me add a KAC alarm for that. Pretty close. Um, except it's actually a little bit later, isn't it? That's that one. This is the one that Curb Alarm Clock itself went for. This is the actual one, if you will. Let's say we were going to a thousand and no insertion burn. Plot it. Then it's just 3,832. Well, a thousand doesn't matter for no insertion burn. But if I add that alarm, that's even later. But let's say insertion burn at 1,000 kilometers. Plot. 5,791. Same time. So, with an insertion burn, for one reason or another, it's better to go at 332, uh, 322 days. So 1,000 kilometers was 5,791. Just takes about 100 kilometers more to get to a 100 kilometer orbit. I mean 100 meters per second more to get to a 100 kilometer orbit. That seems unlikely, right? It takes a lot of uh, juice to get from 1,000 kilometers to 100 kilometers normally. Anyway, our initial orbit around Earth will probably be more like 300 kilometers. Let's get a number on that while we can. 5,751. Not a huge difference. Travel time is 329 days. Well, uh, between the window and the Deimos flyby, we'll barely make it. Hmm. I'd prefer the earlier window. Actually, it's not really obeying the latest departure date either. Oh, I think uh, latest departure... Oh, okay, it's it's misaligned. This is earliest departure, this is latest departure, this is time of flight. Okay. Jeez. Well, it doesn't have arrival date, is the thing I want. I want to set uh, latest arrival date. 
but it doesn't have that option. Oh well. Okay, well, um, let's say latest departure is that day exactly. Maybe that'll give me the right sort of information. So I'll take a little bit more delta V by 200 more. We arrive on year 11 day 186, which is much earlier. Take a look at this contract. That's 30 days earlier than the contract has to be fulfilled by. Okay. All right. Let me add this alarm. Let's start time warping. Uh, we will be upgrading the R&D building first, which is good. We should pop in there and get some more technology lined up. Taking a look, I feel like, um, first of all, if I could figure out where the service module, where the service modules get lighter, that would be really helpful. Improvements to electrical systems, recycling, Heat management systems, totally blank. Storage technology has unresearched requirements. Actuators is an unresearched requirement. That's a requirement for storage. I'm assuming storage technology has something to do with, with the service module tanks, but it's got no available parts involved. Ah, the advanced Gemini lander engine. That has been highly involved in my solar system colonization series. Yes, I've been using that way too much. <laughs> um, uh, doesn't have gimbling here though. Sort of the equivalent of the lunar module ascent engine. Maybe I need better solids. It's a thought. I, I guess I should go in for better solids. My solids are horrible right now. They're completely useless. Though, generally, I view solid rocket boosters as completely useless. Um, unit cost. That one's cheap. That one's really expensive. That Minuteman solid rocket motor. Wouldn't touch that. Okay, well, let's research it. We should have some solid rocket motors. I've complained about the need for uh, for communication, so let us get the good calm dishes. And then I'll go in for the nice engines. Okay. We've got an upgrade point. But actually, no, we've got negative 12 upgrade points. Forgot about that. We have time to build a few more of these, don't we? Well, heck, why not, right? Okay, yeah, well, uh, let me build a few more of them. Let me build another pair, Deimos 1 and Deimos 2, since we can. Okay, we are now two days away from the Earth-Mars transfer. We have three sets of Deimos, pro uh, Deimos missions, launchers, if you will ready and so I'm going to roll out the first Deimos 1. Okay well let's see about the instability on the launch pad. Oh there's a shaky. Many g-forces but now KGR has it. I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of possibilities about what's causing this. I can speculate but right now let's Let's just focus on the fact that this is now stable. And I've got time warp to when the longitude of ascending node is close to zero, which means we're on the same plane. Well, I don't know if the alarm actually wants us in the same plane, really. Um, there's a normal delta V of 550. That's a lot of normal delta V. Very interesting. Ejection inclination is 2.69 degrees. Don't think we'll be too far off from that if we line up with the ecliptic. Or I don't think that they'll necessarily be too far to go. Oh, our, our liquid oxygen is going away. Hold on. 
Let's activate the pump. And doesn't seem like we're getting electric charge through it. That's interesting. There's no electric charge from this particular launch stability enhancer. Well, thankfully we have a lot in the probe itself. Important thing is the two parts of the mission can dock to each other. We'll worry about the rest later. I wonder how long it takes for the pl uh, plutonium to deplete. Hope it's not uh, longer than our trip. Okay, SAS on, throttle up. Everything looks fine. Ignition. And launch. So putting the launch stability enhancer higher didn't really help very much. That much I think I can say. Or at least just that one. Maybe I should have put more. Uh, can't say that putting one of them higher helped. I didn't mention in the VAB, but the dish I used was an AIES antenna, and it seems like uh, somebody in the comments mentioned that uh, it was RO compatible, it's just that the particular way that certain things were being applied made it to pop up with the not RO compatible message so I'll take that going with a pretty flat trajectory because most of Delta V is gonna come from this stage and it's gonna have a high high g-force high acceleration for an extended period of time especially since I'm gonna throttle down pretty soon We'll get this into a slightly higher orbit and then have the second part chase it, the Deimos 2. Okay, we'll throttle down to limit it to 3 Gs here. The throttling range on the NK-15s is about 50%, I think it's like 53%. So just in case people don't know, when you throttle down, of course, we don't do that very often in uh, realism overhaul, but just uh, it's only reading 33% here, but uh, it's actually 67% throttle here, and that's because the full throttle range here is only representing the the real throttling range of the engine. So the bottom of it is at 53% throttle or something like that. Looks like we'll end up going about um, 5,000 meters per second by the end of this stage. Maybe a little less than that. We've got 3,000 meters per second on the next stage, so it should be fine. Now our time to apoapse is still increasing. We need 8 minutes to burn the next stage. Alright, high G-forces. No way I can limit them anymore, so they're going to 6 Gs. Got peak out at about 7 Gs, it looks like. Alright. Stage set. And ignition. Alright, ignition of what I'm gonna call the RD-58 is good. Do I trust the fairings? Let's check. Okay, fairing release is good. Ten eye out. Actually, uh, yeah, we are we are okay in terms of not being in the atmosphere. All right. Well, we lost a lot of charge on the launch pad, so I guess we'll put the solar panels out too. Very good. I'm a wee bit concerned at this point that I've mis misjudged the power consumption situation yet again. You know how that is. Let me uh, target Earth with the main dish and activate. Well, we've got extra drain there. Not that far off from the sun. Now, while time warping 
the upper cores will go into low power mode. The Abel does not. The Gina does, but we're gonna be dumping that. We'll have extra solar panels on the transfer stage. But we also have another core on the transfer stage. Oh, I have it on low throttle, but this engine doesn't throttle anyway, but I guess I might as well, just for show, put it to full throttle. Let me lock the probe zone fuel to make sure we don't use any of that prematurely. Oh, why is... Oh, it is hydrazine, okay. We shouldn't have been using hydrazine, though. We should have been. We should have used the aerozine. I forgot that. I, well, I didn't know when I built the probe that we had aerozine and N204 available. The aerozine would have been much better than the hydrazine. Oh well. Okay, well that's good enough. 306 by 275. Okay, we are once again littering space, but let's separate the actual mission. Okay, verify that RCS is going to function. Uh, hmm. Where is that RCS getting fuel from? Hold on. Ah, it's this. Let me see. Okay, now only the aerozine consuming RCS is functional. Very good. All right. So, first mission is up. Let's get the second part underway, dock them together, fulfill that contract, and see what we can do from there. Okay, here we go again. How many G's will it be this time? Faster launch clamps this time. All the way through. KGR seems to be blinking on and off here. Unsure of whether it should do something. But it looks like with the fast launch clamps, it is stable. Okay, um, now because it took 14 hours to get this onto launch pad, we are now way out of alignment with our target. Okay, that's pretty close on relative inc inclination, so everything good. KGR again. Throttle up. The fact that KGR is blinking like that, I have no idea what to make of it. Okay. We are pretty close to RAM limit. We are at 3.34 gigabytes of RAM, but I'm gonna try this. All right, ignition. And launch. Again, booster separation is gonna be a big question mark. Okay, looking very good here. Not much electric charge though, we still lost quite a lot of it. I'm probably turning a little bit too quickly. This has a lot more lag to it than the other rocket. So I'm uh, pressing the pitch button faster than I should. Not as many nozzles on the bottom as Soyuz obviously. Soyuz does have that charming 20 nozzle thing going for it, not including the verniers, I know the verniers. If you include the verniers, what is it, uh, 36? 36 total? No, no wait, uh, no. Only four, uh, 32 nozzles on the bottom. Oops, lost the target. God, this is way too complicated to find targets with. So, looking at it, actually, I've had forgotten about the whole time it takes to roll them out for launch. And the whole idea of going into lower orbit with this one and a higher orbit with the other one was because the higher or the first one would be ahead. Actually, it's behind right now. So we should go into a higher orbit with this one. Ah, so complicated. All right. So let's aim higher with this one. Alright, getting ready for booster separation here. Let's see how it looks.
Okay, set. Well, I think that's pretty darn convincing. Doesn't uh, flip around as quickly as Soyuz boosters do. Then again, we do have a little bit of lag, so maybe, maybe that's quicker than it looks. Okay, throttling up again. Now, the next stage has pretty decent thrust weight ratio throughout, so we really don't need to reserve too much time to apoapsis for it. I think it starts out at 1G and heads on up from there. Uh, yeah, just about 1G and ends up at 3.14 Gs. I have no idea what's passing by down there right now. What the heck is going... This is some piece of debris that's going past down there, but anyway, we need to do stage set. Alright, and ignition. First time I'm trying this, this is the engine that's used on the second and third stage of the Proton. A UDMH and N204 stage. Alright, fairing set. And that's off. We are in space, so let's get the antennae out and solar panels out. So interestingly, this shows 0.6 generation, 1.2 drain, but we're actually gaining electric charge here. So I don't know what's up with this. Cross your fingers, but it doesn't seem like the fact that this RD58 has a node problem is actually causing any issues right now. Obviously, it's still clipped into the fairing piece. Meanwhile, on this engine, it looks like the plume is not quite in the right place. It probably should be shifted down just a little bit. Based on the way the plume is, I'm guessing this used to be some sort of LV-909 or something. You know, a, a short stubby engine instead of something with a long nozzle. I'm pretty sure these engines don't throttle. The RD0210s. They also don't reignite, so let's get this right. Get into a high orbit here. That's plenty high. Okay. Right. Whoa, we've got some spin. Let's separate the tank off. Activate RCS. Orbit prograde, please. Yep, and it's gonna take some time to match up. Oh, it looks like the reason why we're getting more electric charge generation was because the RD0210 produces power? I think it must have been producing power. We've got a drain here right now. That's no good because we have a drain on the other portion as well. And again, we're turning around and, well, no, I mean, we're not too far off from the sun. Jeez. Then again, uh, with this, like I said, on time warp, we're not going to have a drain. And same with the other portion. On time warp, uh, the core goes into low power mode. So we should be okay, maybe? Maybe. Anyway, this portion is only connected to the probe for the transfer burn. We'll see. Okay, it looks like we've hit the Earth to Mars transfer point. Unfortunately, we're not ready to do the transfer. I should have left three days or four days before the transfer point. Hopefully, uh, spending another day trying to get our two portions of this mission together is not going to throw things off too much. We've lost a lot of liquid oxygen already. This is a very bad thing. I didn't realize we would lose that much. I mean, this, this stage was on its own. 
The idea that would, we would lose that much liquid oxygen in only 12 hours is actually pretty darn ridiculous. When are we going to unlock cryogenic tanks anyway? Maybe with the J2? I mean, we haven't uh, started researching that technology. I mean, we had 8,000 Delta V, now we only have 6,000, just call it 200. Close approach distance. 224.4 meters, sounds good. Okay. Our second burn with this engine will be the velocity matching burn. Looks like we only need about 75 meters per second or so. Okay, excellent. Bit of RCS forward. Oh, take off caps lock, RCS forward. Okay, uh, point two to target. I have some hydrazine here that I don't have any idea. Oh, it's in the Ranger Block 1 core. Really didn't need that. Okay, we are now at the Deimos 1. Going to control from here. Well, it looks like we're fully charged up now somehow. Okay, looking good. Now 40 meters. Closest approach distance is 0.2 meters. My only concern at this point is that the game will crash right when we dock. Alright, getting close now. 2 meters. Oh, we've got magnetism. Wow. So these docking ports actually have magnetism on them. Amazing. Okay, well, uh, we've got the one engine there. Let's actually get that all the way down. 3,000 meters per second available to us. Not the amount I wanted, which was 3,600, 3,800 or so. But, you know, you take what you can get. I think I'm going to leave it here for now, so in the next episode we'll need to transfer it very quickly. I did a lot of building beforehand on this episode, so that took a lot of time. So next episode we're going to try and transfer it over to Mars, get into orbit around Deimos, the prescribed orbit around Deimos. Oh, let's check if we filled the, filled the contract here. First docking. Um, it seems like we've fulfilled the requirements but it hasn't fulfilled the contract yet uh, let me try and quick save before anything else goes wrong I generally don't quick save very much but whenever you encounter something that looks like a glitch you might want to do so you never know what's causing it so, yeah, I mean, says we're docked, we launched a new vessel, yeah, periaps is above 150 kilometers. Now, I've had the thing where it doesn't recognize it. I'm gonna try and go back to the space, hold on, wait a minute, it's pausing, auto-saving. Let me try and go back to the space center first. Okay, well, the game crashed right there. Pretty pretty predictable, actually. And it looks like... It doesn't look like we have the docking contract anymore, so contract complete. We have hard lock. Nice work. Completion rewards are confirmed. Alright, let's uh, clear all the stage destroyed messages, which are all expected, and... Uh, Completion of the scan. So yeah, okay, we got done. All right. Well, the next thing is trying to transfer over to Mars. Um, we could launch another pair during that window there. So if we want to, we've got an extra pair. And if for some reason I feel like there's a problem with this one, we could edit it in the VAB. 
hopefully the edits won't take more than 19 days and then launch it in that window. So that's another possibility. But for now, I'll uh, end it here and we'll try out the transfer over to Mars in the next episode. Alright, so thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.